Greetings, dear viewers. This is George from Ireland, and I'm continuing my series about the travels in the north of Ireland, uh, going from 1974 onwards. So the UK had tried an internal political settlement within Northern Ireland, though involving the Republic of Ireland, the Irish dimension, as they called it, because that was um, a precondition for the SDLP. They wouldn't agree to be um, in office with the UUP and the Alliance Party unless the Irish Republic was involved as well. The SDLP wanted this. They obviously had the long-term goal of a single island separate from Great Britain. Uh, moreover, they needed that for credibility with their own community because um, the IRA and the IRA's party, Sinn Féin, were uh, denouncing um, uh, the SDLP as Quislings for getting into bed with the Unionists and saying, let's remember, the Unionists, they're behind the RUC and the UDR, and then to some extent, the loyalist ter terrorist groups as well. Um, anyway, we know that the um, UK government had secretly um, spoken to the IRA in 1972, not negotiated as such, because they weren't offering each other things. Um, but having failed with the constitutional parties, um, Her Majesty's government spoke to uh, the IRA again in December 1974. It's quite astonishing considering by the 80s, the Prime Minister Thatcher was saying, no, we'll never speak to terrorists. And um, Sinn Féin in the 80s was to publish a document setting the record straight, which gave chapter and verse on all the contacts between the IRA and British government ministers, direct contacts, not through uh, intermediaries in the 70s. So December 1974, there was another truce, which lasted into January 75. Um, but nothing came of that. Uh, and so that was the last such truce uh, for 20 years. Um, <clears throat> anyway, another major development in 1974. Um, well, the official IRA had declared a ceasefire a couple of years earlier. The official IRA had its own political party, um, official Sinn Féin, and they'd become a Marxist party. They'd wish to unite the working class, both denominations, and having done that, only then pushed for a united Ireland. They claimed that Northern Ireland was a colony, and they saw this as an anti-colonial battle. But they realised that the conflict, far from drawing the proletariat together, was in fact polarising it, and so it was completely counterproductive. But um, some uh, official IRA people were dissatisfied with this approach, and they felt they needed to continue fighting. Moreover, um, they uh, were horrified by the bestial loyalist uh, attacks upon the Catholic civil population. So there was a desire to retaliate. Um, and uh, the, uh, the INLA was formed, Irish National Liberation Army. And its uh, political party was the Irish Republican Socialist Party. They looked back to the Easter Rising of 1916. The Irish volunteers had participated in that, and they grew into the IRA. The Irish Citizens' Army had also participated in the Easter Rising, and they were led by James Connolly, um, who was a socialist. His party was, was called the Irish Socialist Republican Party, ISRP, but this party founded in 1974 was the IRSP. Nevertheless, they traced their, um, le their heritage back to Connolly and his ideas. So they were Marxists. They were um, ultra-left. Um, so they... Um, commenced their campaign, uh, killing a few RUC officers and soldiers, and only then announced uh, their existence. And their leader was Seamus Costello, um, who was from Wicklow, and he'd served in the RAF in the Second World War. As I said, it was not unusual for Irish Catholics from the north or the south to enlist in the British military until the 70s. Beyond then, it was highly controversial and dangerous. Uh, an Irish person who'd been in the Crown Forces who returned to Ireland could well be bumped off um, if on leave. So um, the INLA, um, they uh, castigated the um, provisional IRA. The INLA denounced the provisionals, saying you're sectarian. Uh, the INLA themselves went on to commit some uh, heinous uh, sectarian crimes. Now, admittedly, the loyalist terrorists were killing Catholics in rather larger numbers than the Republicans killed uh, uh, Catholic civilians. Um, anyway, so December 1974, that's when the INLA kicked off their campaign, just as the provisional IRA were calling a truce. Now, one of the reasons why that truce failed and any and again, attempt at negotiations was scotched was partly because of the INLA's campaign, presumably deliberate, um, because the security forces and the unionist community couldn't quite distinguish between the INLA and the provisional IRA. Did the INLA even exist? Was the, were the provisionals carrying out these attacks under the name of another of a bogus organization? Um, 
Anyway, so uh, the, the UK government had uh, invited the provisionals to call this ceasefire in uh, December 1974, for, but uh, it didn't get anywhere. Um, uh, so anyway, the loyalists were um, eager to provoke the IRA, so they, they kept up their attacks. The IRA took the bait and engaged in this tit-for-tat sectarian slayings. Um, at this point, Harold Wilson's Labour government decided that uh, parleying with the IRA was pointless. Uh, moreover, the British government had tried just about every political solution they thought was viable. So the only thing to do was simply concentrate on improving the security situation. Um, and um, at this stage, it doesn't seem that anybody um, in the Labour or Conservative parties uh, contemplated a doomsday scenario, doing what the Republicans wanted, saying, right, that's it, the British military is withdrawing, the six counties of Northern Ireland, you're part of the Republic, and that's it, and washing their hands of it. Had, had that happened, it would have been an Armageddon, because um, the Loyalist terrorists, together with the wider Unionist community, uh, would have fought um, uh, to the bitter end, I suppose. Now, the Irish army only had about 10,000 soldiers, quite lightly armed, would have been very difficult, they would have been drawn into some um, counterinsurgency, and probably would have reached an accommodation uh, with Loyalist partisans. Could we call them terrorists in that situation? Possibly. Uh, my own view is Northern Ireland should be part of the UK or the Republic of Ireland should definitely not be independent. There's, there's something to be said for being part of the UK or the Irish Republic or even a condominium, but not being independent. That's got already, almost no legitimacy. Um, and um, it's doubtful a, minor, a majority of people would want that anyhow. So um, uh, Wilson felt that um, discussing things with the IRA had legitimised them and undermined Unionist trust uh, in London. And part of the re reason Unionists have been arming to the teeth is because they thought they might well be abandoned. Um, so nothing further was to be gained from discussion uh, with the IRA. So peace was extraordinarily delicate, was going to be very, very difficult to, begin, to, to build, um, but could be smashed in a moment, as the, the failure of these uh, truces had shown. Um, so the security force was, forces were finally learning what they needed to be doing. They had a presence on the streets of Republican areas in Belfast, like the Foyle and Falls and the Ardoin, uh, and the Bogside and Derry. Um, South Armagh was, was a tough nut for them to crack. So um, the senior British officer in Northern Ireland a couple of years earlier had been Brigadier Sir Frank Kitson, and he'd written the textbook on it, uh, Low Intensity Warfare. And uh, the British got reasonably good at this. They had their doctrine of this, and there'd been various colonial conflicts like... Um, uh, Cyprus or um, uh, South Arabia, that's Yemen, Kenya, um, where these sort of things have been tried before. Not that it was a colony, because the UK, well, had Northern Ireland as, a, as an integral part of the country, and of course, Northern Ireland was represented in Westminster and all the rest of it. So soldiers move around in bricks, that's groups of four, looking left, looking right, walking backwards and so on, constantly shifting position, making it difficult for um, snipers to get their crosshairs on them. The security forces got better at gathering intelligence and uh, uh, recruiting informants, so petty criminals would be um, offered to be informants rather than go to prison. They'd be back out. The IRA at this stage had no qualms about taking criminals into their ranks. In fairness, the British Army also had uh, criminals there, the British Army would, would actually advertise to juvenile delinquents when they're in young offenders institutes. It was seen as a way to, to go straight afterwards. If someone had a very serious criminal record, they wouldn't be allowed in. Um, so um, IRA made sometimes cracked under interrogation and uh, could be turned into double agents, um, would be released, have to meet their handler every so often, given some cash and told what's what. Low-level informants would first of all um, have to provide chicken feed, just information the security forces already had. Both the IUC and the army ran informants. Um, however, uh, um, after a few weeks, the security forces would demand more valuable information. Uh, the goal at the beginning was simply to establish a relationship and prove the person's bona fides, that this informant was providing genuine um, information. The security forces were also able to black people, uh, blackmail people into, into being informants if they found out that someone was having an extramarital affair, or someone was a closet homosexual, things like that, someone had been stealing from the IRA. There was also psychological warfare out of the army's headquarters in, quarters in Lisbon. Some people called it the Lisbon Lime Machine. The IRA engaged in armed robbery, as they often did. They had announced they stole a certain amount of money. Um, the uh, journalists would be told the IRA had stolen double that amount of money. 
Therefore, the IRA commander would believe his subordinates had stolen a lot and kept some of it for themselves, rather giving it to the cause. There were ways to speak to informants, meet them um, in places uh, where they weren't going to be observed or hand over notes, um, or indeed arrest them, because the known IRA men were regularly arrested. Incidentally, internment was being wound down. They were being gradually released um, uh, at this time, and uh, the government was going towards a policy of criminalization, prosecuting terrorist uh, suspects through the courts in the regular manner, uh, loyalist as well as uh, as well as um, Republican. Anyway, this uh, leads towards uh, Ulsterization, which is a new policy, and that'll be in the next video.